All right, Exodus chapter 32. And that'll get us to where, uh, where we'll, we'll read our God make this statement. Uh, he says to Moses, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them. Who's them? Well, Israel. <laughs> the entire nation. You know, uh, most think about two million came out of Egypt, but they argue the point, you know, the Bible scholars, and some of them say as many as six million. I mean, but we know a lot of Israelites came out of Egypt. Now, and, and the reason God says to Moses, he wants to be left alone, he says that I may consume them, that I may consume them. Now, if you go to this Hebrew word consume, it's, uh, I've got it here in my notes. It is the word kala. And here, here is the breakout, the definition. It means, uh, it means to destroy, and listen to this one, exterminate, kill. God said to Moses, just, just leave me alone. And, and he, 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 look at that. Uh, that my wrath may, may wax hot against them. Mm. Why was God mad enough to kill? Why? Well, for that, we're going to have to read verses 1 through 10 of the same chapter. And verse number 1, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves to gather unto Aaron, brother of Moses, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, mind you, small g, and not just one, but plural, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, that man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, you know, he's, he's the assistant to Brother Moses. He's, and you know, by the way, did you know in Acts, the, this congregation is called a church of the wilderness? Yes, that's, that's what this is referred to by Luke, who is inspired by God to write Acts. This is the church in the wilderness, um, the congregation in the wilderness, the assembly. And um, so uh, this is what Aaron tells the congregation. And he received them at their hand, verse 4, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf and uh, which was uh, representative of Baal down in Egypt, which is what God took them out of, what God brought them out of. That's what Aaron's going to do to help them is bring all of that back into the, into the church of the wilderness. And they said, and, and they said, uh, these be thy gods, O Israel, wow, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Altar is a place of what? People go to an altar to do what? Worship, talk to God. So, so we know there, there's going to be worship uh, you know, activity taking place uh, in this church in the wilderness. And, uh, and by the way, these things are written for our learning. They're in samples unto us, according to 
Paul to the church at Corinth. Something to be gleaned here for the church. <laughs> Uh, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the who? See all the old capital? Jehovah. So we're talking about uh, worship activity uh, that, that, that is supposed to be around Jehovah God, the only true and living God, uh, Beside me there is no God, he proclaims by the prophet Isaiah. He knows of no other. And, uh, and they rose up early on the, mor on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people uh, sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And they rose up to fornicate. They rose up to go into immorality, adultery, uh, fornication, all manner of, of, uh, of sexual sin. And, uh, and the Lord said unto Moses, uh, who's up on the mountain, you're receiving from God the tables of stone and the finger of God writing the commandments. And uh, the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves, perverted, perverted. They have turned aside quickly. Do you know how close a person is to turning aside from God's word, God's will? Do you know? Do you know? how close a person always is to turning aside from all that. I'll tell you how close, one decision away. You're always one decision away. <laughs> That's close, isn't it? That's a fine line, isn't it? Uh, which I commanded them, verse 8, they have made them a molten calf and have, and have done what? That's key word to understanding why God is mad enough to kill and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them. Wow. Yeah. Did you ever think of something and the more you thought about it, the matter you got? Well, that's what's happening to God right now. Uh, righteous, holy, sinless God. It's, it's, it's festering, you know that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation, says to Moses. So, now I want to bring you back to uh, verses 4 and 5 of this passage. We're going to key in on, on something here as we try to, uh, to understand uh, why God is mad enough to kill. All right, verse number four, and he received them at their hand, you know, the gold, the jewelry, and, and uh, which I think it's well been said, all that gold, all of those uh, precious uh, jewels, all of that that they brought out of Egypt, you know, they were in, they were in slavery for how many years? Well, that, that's, that's what we call back pay for 400 years of slavery. And, and God intended that to be a blessing and, and be, a, be a benefit as they would go to the promised land. Uh, but uh, well now we can see what they do with it. And, uh, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to 
the Lord. We're going to have church in the wilderness, and we're going to have a worship service. And uh, and they brought that uh, they brought that idol to the worship service. In fact, it became the center the center of the worship service. It became the center. And what what is the issue of bringing uh, this? Uh, this uh, golden calf or uh, this idol into the worship service. Uh, What is is the issue here? Uh, Well, tell me, if you would, uh, define idol for me. You know, uh, Yes, and I'm going to add this to it. Something that takes the place of God or displaces God in the life of his child. Of course, the lost, the unsaved, they have, you know, they, uh, and until Jesus comes in, they, you know, they are what they are. They're lost, but, but we're talking about uh, the people God calls his own here. And uh, now, so uh, takes the place of God, all right? Now, go with me and just do your best to follow along. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And so we're going to just lay a little groundwork here as quickly as I can. And that is 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. And... uh, We'll, we'll drop down to verse 20. And then I'll, I'll read on through verse number 22 because in context, this concerns idols and idolatry. And this will help us to understand what made God so mad he could kill. Well, in, in fact, not that he could kill. He was going to kill. He was going to kill. Okay. Now look at this. Uh, verse 20 But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, and by the way, did you know, have you heard of the mixed multitude that came out with the Israelites? There was a mixed multitude. They were not all Jews. They were not all Israelites. Uh, Others came out with them. Uh, They sacrifice to, oh my, would you look at, And not to God, the only true and living God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You know, uh, what I'm taking away from that is it's got to be one way or the other. It cannot be both. It's got to be It's got to be um, all God or not at all. It's kind of like what God said. Remember, you cannot mix light and dark. I believe he said that to the church at Corinth. You turn the light switch off, it's dark. You turn the light switch on, it's light. The two don't don't co-mingle, do they? It's, It's one or the other. Can't be both. And uh, you, you cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Now, remember, God told his people that he's jealous. He's jealous, God. Are we stronger than he Now, so when that idol was brought into the church of the wilderness and given center stage by the altar, we understand from this passage who came into the church with that idol. Devils. Now, you know, how many devils are there? How many devils are there? Well, You know, we say there's one devil, but 
demons. Demons. But one devil, but a vast host of demons. So I want you to understand as we connect the dots, you know, precept with precept, and, and, we, and we just put all this together, I hope it helps all of us to understand what, what, um, uh, what caused God to be so mad that he could kill here. Okay. Now, let's be reminded what it is that the devil is after. And so to help us with that, let's go to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's what he's always been after. <laughs> and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I just want you to look at this one verse here. Uh, of course, now, now we're looking ahead to the time of the, of the Great Tribulation church has been raptured, uh, Antichrist has come on, uh, the lawless one. Now look at it, and uh, verse number four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So you remember the key word back in Exodus? I kind of asked you to underscore that, mental note, worship. Well, here it is, uh, uh, or that is worship, so that he as who? He as God. Uh, this is Satan incarnate. This is the part of the false trinity, uh, the Antichrist. So that he as God sitteth in the temple, whose temple? The temple of God. The temple that will be reconstructed I think soon after the church is raptured, uh, and uh, you know, modern building technology, it's been determined the temple that took over 40 years to build 2,000 years ago can be built now inside of one year. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> so not a problem to build that temple, the first part of the tribulation, uh, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is who? You know what Satan's always been after? You know what so enraged God about what the church brought in to the worship service? It, it was so facilitating to the devil. It's exactly what the devil has been after uh, since uh, the fall of man. Well, there's more. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. We'll get just a little more help here uh, from Isaiah Here's a well-known passage that I'm thankful that God gave this to us uh, because it, it, it's a window into the heart and the mind of Lucifer. Uh, but Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12. Uh, I'm going to read on down a few verses, uh, probably verse 15, but verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Yeah, the congregation, he wants that worship. He wants the worship of the congregation of God's own. He's after that. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And God's answer to that, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And God gets the final word. Uh, last but not least, Matthew chapter 4, to help us understand why God's, uh, well, you know the way we would say it, why his blood is boiling. That's, you know, in uh, Matthew Chapter number four, 
um, Now here I want to look at verses 8, 9, and 10 with you of Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him, Jesus, up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, all of the the riches, uh, and saith unto him, now look what the devil says to Jesus and really to God, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt do what, class? If thou wilt fall down and worship me. So it all comes back to what is the devil after? Well, uh, he wants that. He wants to be God and he wants the worship. Do you understand what happened on that day in in the wilderness? in the church of the wilderness? Who did they bring into the camp? Who did they set an altar up unto? And who, in fact, were they worshiping? That's what the devil wants. That's what he's always been after. And you know, he's still after that today. as it concerns idol, idols. Is an idol always a golden calf? Is that the only thing that constitutes an idol? Had a, had a young couple uh, visit. And I'm glad they did. I'm glad they came in to hear the Word of God. They came one time and they've never been back. And I did a follow-up visit to go thank them for attending. And told them I appreciate it. And I didn't see this coming, but they had a complaint. They had a complaint. I said, where's your band? You don't have a band. You know, and what should we, what should we attend um, the church. Uh, what what should we, what should be the basis of our attendance to the church? What 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 should be the basis of our attendance to any of God's local New Testament churches? It, it, is it is it is it the band? And have the band. Well, should be the same reason people congregated together 2,000 years ago. Do you remember the thousands of people that would throng around Jesus? Do you remember? At the Sea of Galilee? Or was it the house where they cut a hole in the roof to let the uh, paralyzed man down through the roof. Uh, but but, but they, couldn't, they couldn't get to Jesus because of the throng of people, the thousands of people. Uh, when Jesus was uh, out of the city and thousands of people, 5,000 plus the wives and children, they think probably would have been more like 15,000, but they only counted the men. But you had their families and everybody. Uh, and the time that Jesus taught for three days, he, he, three days out there, and the disciples said, now, you, you know, it's getting dark. You better, let them, you better let them go home, or you better let them go, I think the word, find some victuals, <laughs> lest they faint in the way. Remember what Jesus said right back to the disciples? He said, you feed them. You, you, you give to meet that need. But here's the point I'm, I'm coming to is those thousands and thousands and thousands of people 2,000 years ago 
On what basis did they congregate around Jesus? On the, uh, what, what was the activity that drew them? To hear the what? Thank you. The Word of God. I'm concerned when someone bases their attendance upon anything other than the Word of God. The Word of God. I'm concerned because if the Word of God is not adequate, sufficient, for people to congregate around, and remember, who promised to be here? And this is in context of the local New Testament church where two or three are gathered together in my name. Who promised to be here? See, when Jesus has promised to be here and his word is being taught true to the message that he intended, I'm concerned when anybody um, decides not to attend because we don't have a band or we don't have any number of other activities. Could I call it that? <laughs> um, because what I'm concerned about is um, can you tell me what is more important than Jesus Christ and his word? To me, that's the draw. That's, that's my reason for being here. Yeah. So, um, we should attend solely on the basis of God's word because of God's promised presence and because it's God's command for his children to assemble together. And so much more as you see the day approaching. Second <laughs> um, Corinthians, uh, so I guess I took the long way around the block with that question. Uh, uh, are, are golden calves the only idols? No, no, no. Anything, anything that has more importance than does Jesus Christ and his word, uh, be careful. Be very careful. Uh, um, all right, 2 Corinthians. Uh, let's, let's, let's go to 2 Corinthians. But I, I didn't see that coming. I just did not. I, I did not see that coming. And I didn't feel like I needed to apologize because all we have here is Jesus and his word. I didn't feel like I needed to apologize for that. <laughs> um, now, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. And uh, get myself there. So... And it's like, well, you know, let's bring this in. Let's bring this into the church. Because maybe if we bring this in, then we'll get uh, more numbers. Yet I submit to you, Jesus said, I'm in. His word is in. I'll leave the numbers up to God. That's God's business can't just bring any old thing in the way they did. Um, there is nothing more important than the Lord Jesus Christ in his word. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll, I'll read 15 through 18. I do think we ought to have Christ honoring music. Um, that draws us closer to Jesus and away from the world. Remember when Moses came down, uh, remember what he said, uh, 
the sound of war. There's the sound of war in the camp. But it was music. It was music. But it wasn't music that drew them closer to God because the net result of the music, they ended up in fornication. So it wasn't Christ-centered, godly music. It was music that facilitated the sin nature, the flesh. And that's how it ended. They were in adultery, they were in fornication, and they were in trouble. All right. Now, uh, notice here, let me get, get my bearings. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 15, and what concord that, you know, agreement hath Christ with Belial, Christ and the devil. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, now watch this, wherefore, because Israel did exact opposite of this, but God says, wherefore, come out from among them, who's them? Tell me who them is. Yeah, unbelievers. We would say the world. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Got to quickly hurry. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Uh, and by the way, interestingly enough, this is all coming out of the, uh, the letter to the Corinthians. Uh, what is, what is Corinth? Uh, noted for? You know, every chapter they're in trouble. Every single chapter they're in trouble. But they are noted for their carnality. That is, living as close to the sin nature as they possibly could. And as far away from walking in the spirit as they possibly could. Very carnal. All right, here we are. First uh, Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, verse number four. Did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock. We, we do have the rock here. We do have the rock here. I guess it depends on what kind of rock you're looking for. That followed them, and that rock was Christ, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters, as they were uh, some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up too play, meaning they, well, verse 8, neither let us commit what? Commit what? Yeah, that's what they did. That's what they were, that's what the play was all about. They went into all kinds of uh, sin. As some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Why didn't God kill them? Well, let's get the answer. Why didn't God kill him? Exodus 32, got to go back to Exodus chapter 32 to get the answer to that. And we're, we're, we're racing toward the finish line here now. And that is Exodus chapter 32 and uh, verse, uh, yeah, we're going to read verse 11 through 14 now. And what I, wanted, what, what I wanted you to see in this lesson tonight was the intercessory work of Christ. And I wanted you to see it from the life of Moses. And, and, and boy, may God find us thankful for our intercessor, Jesus Christ. Uh, because I'm going to say something to you. Were it not for the intercessory work of Jesus Christ, none of us would be here tonight. 
where would we be? Well, we'd all be dead. We'd all be dead. And Moses, verse 11, besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Now, you know, Moses is the pastor of the church of the wilderness, and he's like, what's going on here? Uh, Which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand, wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I've spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And what was Moses doing? It's a picture of what Jesus Christ does every single time a child of God goes into sin. It's the same thing Jesus does. Now Jesus doesn't say what Moses is saying, but, but he does what Moses is doing. And and why is it necessary for Jesus, God the Son, to intercede, get between us and God the Father? Something must be going on in God the Father's uh, countenance for Jesus to have to get between us and the Father and intercede for it. Well, what, what do you suppose it is about Jehovah God, about God the Father? I think he still gets mad. I think he still gets hot. And, and when that happens, because we have failed or faltered or sinned as a child of God, Jesus gets between the Father and us. And what does Jesus do? What, what, is he, what does he say? I paid for that. I paid for that sin. That sin is paid for. And so God the Father lets us live because Jesus intercedes. God, the, God was ready to destroy an entire nation. Now, they, you know, they say between one and six million people. God was ready to just that's it. Moses got between Israel and God and interceded. Uh, Isaiah 53, verse 12. We got, we got a race to the finish here. Isaiah 53, verse number 12. Uh, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great this is the Father speaking about Jesus uh, in the aftermath of his great passion his, uh, at Calvary. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death, speaking of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. And he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. But there's a couple of, in Romans 8 and verse 34. I want you to see this, uh, this powerful one, Romans 8 and uh, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. That is, Christ died for our sins. Yea, rather, that is risen again. He, he rose victorious over sin. Uh, he broke the power of sin. He broke the power of death. He broke the power of hell. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh, what class? Why does he, why does he keep having to make intercession for God's children? Because every day God's children foul up, goof up, mess up. 
in their thought life or in their action. <laughs> and you've got somebody between you and God the Father to um, save you from his wrath because it literally makes him mad enough to kill. <laughs> wow. And finally, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 25. It'll be the last scripture we're going to look at. Hebrews uh, chapter 7 and verse 25. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost. So, you know, I've heard, I've heard it said some people are so bad, so wicked, so evil that they're beyond salvation. Well, I didn't, I didn't find that in the Bible. Here's what I find in the Bible. Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Intercede means to inter intervene on behalf of another. Wow. You have an intercessor if you know Jesus. But you know, if you don't know Jesus, there's nobody between you and God and the wrath of God. And the Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. Father, you said to the church, go and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, I'm glad you loved me enough to send somebody to bring me to Christ. And I do want you to use me to bring others to Christ. And I want you to use this church to bring others to Christ. And uh, Lord, uh, we've seen what we're not to bring into the church. We need to be careful what we bring in the church. Uh, we, we see that 2,000 years ago, your word was enough. Uh, your presence was enough. And, and it's not that you've changed, it's that people have changed. But you're still enough, and your word is still enough. Because... We could bring all kinds of things in here from the world in a vain attempt to increase numbers. But the problem is, uh, you're not going to be in it. And I'd rather have you. I'd rather have you, Lord, and your blessing and your power. So. We'll leave the church building. You said, I will build my church. I pray you'll use us as you do. And you said, God, will, God gives the increase. And you said, the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And so uh, I think we're in good hands. And we've come here tonight to pray. We've got a lot to pray about. But I'm especially thinking right now about someone somewhere in the world. Uh, if they were to die guilty, unforgiven in their sin, there is no one to get between them and the wrath of God the Father. There's no one to intercede. There's no one to plead with you for them. And that's because they've never invited you to come into their life. And you're angry with them every day. God, I pray. I pray for that, that lost soul. I pray for that man, that woman, that young person, anywhere in the world that is watching this, uh, this video. I pray, God, that, that you'd draw them to Jesus. I pray they would invite you to come in. I, I would encourage them. I would, in, if you're joining us, listening right now, I'd, I'd encourage you to just pray, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all of my sins. And then pray, Lord Jesus, please come into my, my life. Please save me. Save me from hell. 
save me from your wrath. Oh, I hope you'll, I hope you'll invite Jesus in before it's too late. But God, I pray you'll find us thanking you tonight that every single time we mess up, every single time we sin, every single time we fail, Jesus gets between us and you, Father. And, and he tells you that sin is paid for. It's under the blood. God, bless your word. I pray, bless the prayer time. In Jesus' name, we ask.